And her question is, is it possible to put an amendment in the Violence Against Women Act that would require states to have a specific presumption against perpetrators of domestic violence getting custody or joint custody of children? So I wonder if one of our counselors would like to address that. <laughs> I'll take a step back. As a lawyer, I don't think you can do it legally because that's asking the federal government to dictate state law. Mm -hmm. And federal government can't dictate state law. What they can do is condition funds. I mean, everything attached to the Violence Against Women Act, the Family Violence Services Prevention Act, CAPTA, you know, all the ways that they give states funds, they can say, well, we're going to give you funds if. That's, that's how it has to be done. Right. And we have another question. Uh, this one does not have a person uh, ascribed to it, but the question is, how can we reform our uh, family courts in the United States? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> how many days do you have? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it, uh, try to get you a copy of my statement. But um, there are a lot of good proposals going around, and the Office on Violence Against Women in the Department of Justice is paying a lot of attention to this. And one of the things that we're trying to surface, and there's at least some discussion of, is the creation of a specialized court that would focus on custody and abuse, so that it would sort of sidestep the whole family called court culture, which is about keeping the father, even if he's an abuser, penalizing moms who are claiming abuse, and try to focus on the children and safety and abuse first, screen it, if it's not there, send it back to regular family court. If it is there, other decisions will flow. That's the kind of thing that I'd like to see a pilot project, federally funded. It could be done in theory, but you know, I think it's a discussion. I think there's complexities attached to that proposal. There's a lot of other great proposals about training judges, training evaluators, conditioning who we appoint as evaluators on screening out people who have certain norms that are counter to understanding abuse, et cetera, et cetera. There's a, there's a lot to be done, but Frankly, I kind of think that the fundamental problem is sort of the culture and the values that are driving decisions, and I don't know that specific trainings or even specific approved laws are going to adequately address that. I think we, have, we, need a, we need a public movement, we need a grassroots movement, and massive public education and media, and then we need specialized courts, I think. I'm Sandy Graham Berman from the University of Michigan. I'm a clinical psychologist and a professor, researcher. Uh, I'm here to tell you a little bit about some of the programs that we have found that actually work to help children exposed to domestic violence and that also enhance their resilience. These are efforts that have taken many, many years to develop and to design and then to go out and test. These are programs that have been supported by uh, funds from the government and they take the program that I'm going to talk about my own took about four years to develop and evaluate. So this is a slow process but we do have some really good news that there are programs there that work, there is help for the kids. Um, one of the programs I'm going to talk about, these are all programs that have um, randomized clinical trials and that have been using the very highest standards, so these are best practices. Um, one is a child parent psychotherapy program, and this was created by Alicia Lieberman and Patricia Van Horn from um, the University of California. And their program is 52 weeks, so it's once a week sessions for the mom and the kid. And their goal is to help um, enhance attachment with mother and child, and thereby reduce problems that might eventuate for the child. Um, this program can be expensive. You have to have the kind of family that can come every single week for a year. I know in a lot of families um, with domestic violence, families in shelters, that's a tall order. Um, they have shown that it reduces behavior problems in kids and reduces the distress of the mother. Um, Ernie Jarillis and Renee McDonald, who Renee just had uh, got to hear from, are from Texas, and they have created Project Support, which is aimed at reducing conduct problems or aggression, delinquency, that sort of thing in kids. They, in their program, they teach mothers management uh, skills for children and provide lots of support to the mothers. And um, with a sample of 66 kids, they have followed them over time. They have the longest follow-up to date, 20 months. So there are changes that have happened have helped, which is a really great, great thing to know about. They've reduced conduct problems with the kids and enhanced the mom's mental health and parenting. So it's a great success. Another program by Conan Manorino at Allegheny Hospital in Pennsylvania, um, they've written a program that um, tries to reduce post-traumatic stress disorder in children. And this is a program that is uh, very brief for eight sessions. 
um, and they have shown that they can reduce traumatic stress symptoms in children. Not all the kids have PTSD, but for those who do, this is an effective way to go. I've worked on a program called the Kids Club and Moms Empowerment Program at the University of Michigan. This is a community-based program that we've now been able to adapt for use in a number of communities um, at La Casa Maria Vasquez in Jamaica Plain in Boston. We've worked with African American families in Detroit. Um, it's been adapted for Asian American families and immigrant families in Washington State, Native American groups in Arizona and Utah. So it's really had a nice run of being uh, changed and modified to fit the needs of the community. And it's a progressive program. It's a group program. And this is different from the other programs. In this program, we put kids in groups and moms in groups. And if you know anything about groups of women, you just have to get them together. And they are going to talk, and they're going to talk about the issues. And with the children, we hope to develop the kind of place where the kids can feel safe. They can feel trust that builds over the sessions. It's a 10-session program. And to be able to talk about their fears and worries, talk about the things that they're afraid of, and try to have safety plans and plans for how they're going to manage the issues that come up. We found this program to be highly effective. 80% of the kids in the program had fewer conduct problems at the end, and also fewer um, problems with anxiety and depression. It also improved their attitudes about what's acceptable about conflict resolution in the family. It's not okay to hit people. It's not okay for people to dominate others, etc. cetera. Um, some of the kids that have become resilient as a result of this program, the biggest element is talking about what happened. So being able to talk about that, finding that therapist, finding that group, finding that supportive person who can help you makes all the difference. When you change the mom, when you improve her mental health, reduce her stress, the kids get better. So working together, the mom and the kid, and that's one of the hallmarks of the Parent Project Support Program as well, really works. This program was just recently adopted for use in Sweden, in the country, paid for by the government. There's an idea. Now, now we know what the problem is and what can be done about it. If we do nothing to help kids like Ariel and Lexi and Norwood as a seven-year-old boy and Jennifer, who's going to be talking next, if we do nothing, society pays a much higher price in treating more serious problems later on in terms of mental health, school failure, incarceration, um, and ruining the lives of adults and even the next generation of children.